What a great feeling bunch of people. Thank you for making some time for me. Uh, the title of this talk is How to Explain Everything. And of course, if you're going to explain everything, you need a good paradigm. And a paradigm is a way of structuring data so that people can understand you better. It's a storytelling tool. And paradigms are created to bridge unknowns. Like you go, so this, so this, so probably that. You know, they're organized word lessons built of, of data and conjecture. And the paradigm that I'm going to show you will help you structure the history and evolution of life. And you can superimpose it on consciousness or uh, personal development, human evolution, societies, spiritual paths, governments, religions, just about anything, and it will reveal new insights. And if there's some philosophic or metaphysical subject that you want to know more about, just start structuring what you know with this paradigm, and more will be revealed. So here's the basic paradigm. When I look at this, I, I think, man, this is just too simple. <laughs> but then the more I play with it, the more excited I become. And I, I know some of you thinking, there goes Harry again, trying to explain everything. <laughs> and he draws a line, and he starts having epiphanies with it. <laughs> but this is so much more than a line. It's, uh, it's an interaction between the two foundations of everything, you know? It's heaven and earth. It's alpha. It's omega. It's, it's, it's God and creation, you know? So yesterday I showed it to Avra. Hey, come here, come here, come here. Come here, come here. Look at this. It's a line, Harry. <laughs> I go, yeah, but, but it, it's, it's a line that's got everything on it. And she has one of those phones that you wear over your ear. And I, I can't tell whether she's talking to me or somebody on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'll be the first to admit that 
I do get carried away sometimes. And I know I went overboard on the triangles thing. <laughs> and probably I went off the deep end with the circles. But this is a line! <laughs> This is what I have been working up to. <laughs> and how much trouble can you get into with a line? At the bottom, you have physical universe. At the top, you have infinite being. <laughs> and in between is everything. <laughs> okay, so all right, stick with me. Let's put the <laughs> evolution of consciousness on the line. Did you ever hear the expression, dull as a rock? We'll put rock down there. Or bright as an angel? We'll put angel up here. And everything else <laughs> goes in there. I mean, doesn't that just explain it all? <laughs> okay, some more details. Imagine that these two poles, oh, that's yellow. Imagine that these two poles are broadcasting a signal. And they go. That's the broadcast from the physical universe pole. It's uh, lots of physical laws and, you know, solid stuff. Here's the broadcast from infinite beingness. And that's undefined awareness. And where the two meet, life happens. As the physical universe end, you have life focused on physical cells, organs, bodies. And at the upper end, life enjoys infinite, eternal beingness, source. And in the middle, you have this complex mixture of physical universe and awareness. Now at the lower end, the mixture of physical universe and awareness is called animal consciousness. In the middle, the mixture of physical universe and awareness is called intellectual consciousness. And at the top, the mixture of physical universe and awareness is called spiritual consciousness. So you have three domains here. And as you go up from the physical universe, up this line, the influence of the physical universe becomes less and the influence of infinite being becomes greater. Now most respected teachers will tell you that the most important undertaking of life is the journey that you make across these three domains. The Buddhist follows the path of Dharma. Um, which means, in essence, taking those actions that you believe will result in the most good. Always do what you believe is right. And this has a strong element of personal responsibility because what you believe is right depends upon where you are in a domain. Animal consciousness is sometimes called the savage mind. 
It's a stimulus response mechanism that is controlled almost entirely by the physical broadcast. And awareness at this level is focused on physical perceptions and body sensations. A savage mind is very good at organizing and developing biological functions. It controls heartbeat, breathing, and digestion. And by manipulating these biological functions, it stimulates the animal level instincts of fear, hunger, and the mating drive. And depending upon what instinct is stimulated, the organism exhibits either a submissive behavior or a dominant behavior. So life at this level down here is controlled by external circumstances. It's savage, it's predatory, and it's selfish. And response is determined by pleasure or pain. If something or someone triggers a pleasure response, the animal will repeat the behavior. If the pain response is triggered, the animal will stop the behavior. Response is automatic. No thinking or decision is required. And the closest that the savage mind ever comes to thinking is, can I eat it? Will it eat me? Can I mate with it? You know? And if it doesn't know the answer to these questions, it just waits for the next stimulus. Now, if this is beginning to sound like some people you know, <laughs> I'm not surprised. By my estimation, about 50% of the current human population operate at this level, which means that the subjects of greatest concern are, can I eat it? Will it eat me? Can I mate with it? Here's an ideal beer advertisement for animal consciousness. It tastes good. It won't hurt you, and it'll make you look sexy. <laughs> well, doe, give me some of that. <laughs> the transformation from animal consciousness to intellectual consciousness happens with the awakening of an awareness of being aware. Intellectual consciousness is not only aware, it's aware that it's aware. I mean, suddenly an I am has materialized. And this I am not only knows, but it knows what it knows, and it knows what it doesn't know. On one hand, it can use the body's perceptions to look outward into the external universe. And on the other hand, it can look inward into this new thing called a rational mind, which begins as a copy of the external universe. Now, whatever modification happened right here that suddenly our DNA gave birth to this I thing and made us more receptive to the broadcast coming from awareness is a subject for speculation. Was, was there some extraterrestrial engineering that took place? Or did a great ape eat a magic mushroom? Or did something in the atmosphere change? The ancient Greeks believed that gods seduced humans, and maybe that's how it started. But whatever it was, it was a miracle moment in time. In the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, uh, Stanley Kubrick speculated that the transformation from animal consciousness to thinking was triggered by this mysterious monolith, remember? And it, 
it broadcast an eerie melody. It was tra transforming music. I mean, why not? Music has charms to soothe the savage beast. So I can't overstate how important and unique to our species it was to cross this threshold. It gave humans dominion over all other animals. And when the moment had passed, the concept of me rode in the rational mind. And it, it rode mostly as a passenger. And humans moved from identifying with a body to identifying with a mind. Now, did you ever buy a car or a computer and discover there was something that the salesman didn't tell you? <laughs> That's what happened with the rational mind. It contained a hidden element. And underneath the chrome and the equations and all the pretty dreams, the savage mind still lurked there. And beneath the reasoned decisions of the new rational mind, the old stimulus response mind of pain was still running. And the savage instincts remained as a subconscious influence. So our interpretation of the world carried old judgments based on past pleasures and pain, and we used the reasoning power of the new rational mind to justify them as right. This is the tragic flaw in the human drama. If you operate on instincts, and the instincts aren't right, you'll go extinct, right? Now that got carried over to the idea that if you operate on beliefs and your beliefs aren't right, you'd go extinct. So the computation of the rational mind became, well, if I believe it, it must be right. And that's what we've been running on. But still, you know, the awakening of the rational mind, it was a landmark event. So now come forward through the next half million years, through the discovery of fire, the spear, the bow and arrow, the domestication of animals, smelting of metals, gunpowder, creation of alphabets, and great works of art up to the dawn of psychiatrists and psychotherapists. <laughs> now, the major contribution of psychiatrists and psychotherapists was the recognition that there might be something wrong with the rational mind. Duh, you think? <laughs> I mean, what was your first clue? Could it have anything to do with our history of wars and atrocities that we commit against each other? I mean, half a million years is a long time before you discover that there's a bug in the program. <laughs> and way too many of us have been running on the indoctrinated beliefs, which of course, if we believe them, must be right, which are nothing more than the leftover artifacts of animal consciousness. I mean, we've used our brilliant technology to destroy each other and sabotage our future. And of course, with good and reasonable justification, we've been justifying and indoctrinating each other with beliefs for a really long time without coming together. And the problem is our savage minds keep pulling us back. I mean, this is the broadcast that's coming from the savage mind. And trust is not an element of animal consciousness. Keeping agreements is not an element of animal consciousness. And we've been tuning in to the wrong broadcast. You could call this Give me radio.
Give me yours. That's not the song that's going to save us. <laughs> the world's problems do not start with scarcity or greed. They start with this savage influence on human consciousness. And uh, the thing we have to solve is how to make care and compassion more valuable than self-importance and impermanent things. And the ultimate solution is broadly awakening the enlightened mind of spiritual consciousness. We need another miracle moment in which everyone realizes that we're in this all together and that the Earth is the only spaceship that we get. And Star's Edge has laid the foundation. Future generations need to direct their greatest efforts toward coming together. I mean, the world needs less superpowers and more friendly tribes. And the me that showed up with intellectual consciousness needs to change from being an indoctrinated passenger in the rational mind to being a responsible owner and driver of the rational mind. And you will play a major role in that transformation. You're part of the construction crew for the next miracle. You deliver Avatar properly, and your students will realize that they are more than minds, and they'll move beyond the influence of indoctrination. I've said it before and I'll say it again. The product of avatar is a source being. And that is the gateway to a spiritual consciousness and the awakening of an enlightened mind. I mean, the root up is not always easy. What with the forgetting of our most important lessons between every lifetime. But the road ahead is now wide open, and it leads to an enlightened planetary civilization. And you are making very good progress. So are you ready to go out in the world and make more source beings? Karen Pryor recently introduced a style of animal training called clicker magic. And it's so amazing and appropriate to this talk that I ask her permission to show you some excerpts from her DVD, Clicker Magic. Clicker magic. Well, it's not magic. It's science but sometimes it can be pretty amazing. Clicker 
operant training is slang for what scientists call applied operant conditioning. The principles that underlie how animals and people learn. Clicker trainers use a little plastic clicker, a noise maker, to mark any behavior that we like. We mark the behavior when it's happening and then we give the animal something it wants, like food or petting or praise. With our clicker, we can build behavior step by step in a process known as shaping. Trainer Catherine Cromer came to one of our seminars and then went home and rescued an abandoned pet at the animal shelter in order to practice her own shaping skills. She videotaped the process step by step and I'd like to use Catherine Cromer's video to review the process of clicker training. The first step is to establish the conditioned reinforcer or the marker signal that you're going to use to tell the animal when it's done the right Get thing. the cat to associate this noise with that food. We're also pairing clicking with petting. She enjoys just as much as the food. I'm sure not all cats do, but this one does, so we use it. It's important in the beginning to use things the animal really likes, especially good food, for example. The next step when you have a signal is to shape a behavior, in this case targeting. Now we're going to get her to touch or target a, in this case, a magic wand. You don't need a magic wand to train a cat, but this one seems to enjoy it. Now in the first few lessons, the animal's going to be a little yeah, inattentive. Table, that was true of some of the puppies that we started with and Gusto. That, that uh, will improve with time. First we show it to her. She touches it. She hears the click. Which by now means that she's going to be eating or being petted. Now she's fairly consistent on touching it, so we're going to add a cue to it, a command to do it. Touch it. We're going to move it to different sides of the table. Touch it. So that she learns to come at some distance. Touch it. And then in order to increase her enthusiasm, we put it on an intermittent schedule of reinforcement, which means that she'll do it more than once touch it, to get a reward. Touch it. Watch what she does with a really long behavior chain. That was really interesting, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, you guys are too aware. It would take something more than a clicker to shape your behavior. Would you smile for me? <laughs> you smile for me? <laughs> you smile for me? Oh. Hmm, money, money. 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 <laughs> Money. <laughs> I can't train myself. You suppose that's what we've been doing? Mm -hmm. I started clicker training my German Shepherd to, to sit and stay, and she caught on right away. I, 
I mean, she really caught on. Um, she started experimenting with various behaviors to see if she could elicit more clicks from me. You know? <laughs> How about if I rub my nose with one paw, boss? No? Okay. How about if I put an ear out like that? <laughs> uh, come on, boss, hit the clicker. I, I do this. <laughs> she cleaned me out of yummies. <laughs> But that's what we've been doing with each other, is uh, doing things to get more clicks or more attention or more money. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as we do it honestly. But the solution that we've really been looking for is more alignment and cooperation, more attention on service to others. We need to become citizens for the planet. Have you ever felt the warmth of the morning sun on your face? And that's what the broadcast from infinite awareness feels like. It inspires goodness and love and compassion. And um, it brings tears to your eyes and compassion to your heart. Here's a review video for you. Power up, power up, power up. There are wonderful possibilities ahead. Hoorah! Thank you. Thank you.